Welcome to Movie Oubliette, the film review podcast for movies that most people have mercifully forgotten. I'm Dan. And I'm Conrad. And in each episode, we drag a forsaken film out of the Oubliette, discuss it and judge it to decide whether it should be set free, <laughs> or whether it should be thrown back and consigned to oblivion forever. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to Movie Oubliette, the transcontinental film review podcast. With me, Dan, betraying my state by not caring one iota about the AFL in Melbourne, Australia. And me, Conrad, watching Wimbledon with some strawberries and cream in Cambridge, UK. (laughs) In this podcast, (laughs) we discuss fantastical films, Horror, fantasy, and sci-fi. Because lonely walks down dark corridors, watching a dwarf in battle, and capping the night off with an alien chest burster is our idea of a perfect date. (laughs) (laughs) Conrad, how are you today? I'm very well. How are you? Mm, Very good. Uh, We have some news coming about the pod. We do. We have some exciting news. We now have a Patreon page. Yeah, we're in the future. (laughs) We are. (laughs) So if you've always wanted to shower us with money, you need worry no more. You can do so. (laughs) Not much money, so don't (laughs) freak. (laughs) No, don't freak out. This is a great opportunity if you would like to support the podcast and help us cover the costs of things like hosting and so on and buying films which we have to search high and low for sometimes Mm, because we're dealing with such weird movies Uh, you can join us on our patreon page and what do you get for your contributions dan well, for one dollar, you get to put a film on the infamous oubliette roulette Ooh. for us to spin and hopefully choose in the future. Yeah, so you can influence which films we do. Be like Chad Rommel and Redma Sixty One. <laughs> yes, indeed. And for five dollars, you get to step it up and get access to all our extra bonus media, all the bits that you never knew. We cut out. <laughs> yes, because surprisingly, we're both windbags and we end up with much more material than we actually use in the episode. Mm. So we thought that it would be fun to share some extra bits with our patrons. And also, bear in mind, we do have guests on our episodes. So mm. they have a lot of extra morsels of trivia and information about films that you never knew you wanted. Yeah. A lot of times they would talk about projects that were unrelated to the the film we were discussing and it was fascinating stuff mm. mind-blowing in some cases yes we're going to start sharing that stuff as these these little audio nuggets to go along with the main podcast exclusively for our patrons that's going to be really fun and we've got a really fun one coming up as our first bonus piece of content shortly it will be the 35th anniversary of the release of the last starfighter believe it or not yeah so we thought for our first bonus clip we we would share with you some discussions we had with Catherine Mary Stewart when we did an episode with her, mm. where she was talking about The Last Starfighter and also, excitingly, Lance Guest, the star of The Last Starfighter, who will be joining us today. Wow. Exciting times. <laughs> it is, yeah. And he's had some great stories about The Last Starfighter, which we have saved, <laughs> including one that I found hysterical. So, yeah, <laughs> check that out. <laughs> so he is joining us today. But, uh, Conrad, what's the film that we'll be discussing with him? Well, it's your turn to go over to that oubliette and drag something out. So time to venture forth. Okay. Okay, I'm just by Oubliette now. Whoa! Ooh! Bit of a swirling vortex, it seems. Yeah, and I feel like I'm regressing to an earlier form. And what's with all the screaming? <laughs> wow, better get something quick. Ugh. This guy's a fucking gorilla. Whew. Welcome back. Okay, whoa. I escaped the inevitable abyss, it seems. <laughs> That's good. 
<laughs> so what do you have for us? I have for us today to discuss with Lance Altered States, mm. the 1980 trippy sci-fi horror psychedelic journey <laughs> into the unknown uh, directed by Ken Russell. Ooh, and what happens in that? Well, Altered States centers on Eddie Jessup, the science researcher intent on discovering the primordial self through psychedelic hallucinations and deprivation chambers. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, his girlfriend and eventual wife, Emily, is just trying to love him. Mm. Even seven years and two kids later, Eddie, now a respected Harvard medical professor, obsesses over seeking the truth. However, what he uncovers is anything but a bad trip. De-evolved goat gobbling apes, spiraling <laughs> steamy vortexes, and a lump of screaming flesh is not the sort of topics Eddie thought he'd be writing in his thesis. <laughs> That's what we have in store today with our guest. Yes, and I've just realised that this movie was released on Christmas Day in 1980. What a gift it must have been. Wow. <laughs> so festive. Who went to that? <laughs> I know. Hey, honey, let's go out and watch William Hurt de-evolve. <laughs> Merry Christmas. OK, can't wait to discuss this with the man who chose it, the actor and star of The Last Starfighter, Lance Guest. Back soon. Yay! Welcome back. And joining us today is a multi-talented actor whose career spans film, television and theatre. He's played Johnny Cash on Broadway, guest starred on shows such as The Wonder Years, The X-Files and House, and played those rare characters who survived the night Michael Myers came home and avoided the deadly jaws of Bruce the Shark. But he's probably most loved among fans of our favourite genres for the time he was recruited by the Star League to defend the frontier against Zur and the Kodan Armada. Yes, I'm very excited to welcome the best possible guest, Lance Guest. Hooray! Hey. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are too kind. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to talk with you. It's great to have you here. We're sort of completing our last Starfighter family because we did an episode with Catherine Mary Stewart last year. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes, yeah, so it's kind of interesting that you both chose films that are kind of similar in a way. So Really? Okay. Yeah. It was difficult for me because I am not a connoisseur of the genre. Hmm. I had to just kind of go with things that have, that I remember affecting me on a more than technical storytelling level. Ah, right. Well, Catherine chose Melancholia, Lars von Trier's film, yes. which depicts nothing less grandiose than the end of the world. But it's very much an art house film. It's focused very much on two sisters and how they deal with this existential threat. And the film that you've chosen for us to look at today is Ken Russell's Altered States from 1980, which focuses on a scientist who's exploring the boundaries of human collective experience and memory all the way back to facing the horror of this moment of existential dread right at the beginning of it all. But it focuses very much on the relationship between the lead scientist, played by William Hurt, and his wife. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm kind of feeling a similarity there between the films chosen by our last Starfighter alumni. You mentioned it was a film you saw a long time ago. I was wondering if we could talk about your memory of seeing it for the first time. Well, my, my memory of seeing it was... Uh... It was recommended by all the uh, guys I went to college with, and many of them who you, you probably know, Shane Black and Fred Decker, and I remember them talking it up. like That was the kind of the big thing, so we went down to Westwood to see it, and I was a William Hurt fan. Mm -hmm. I remember really liking the sort of hyper-intellectual banter that he has with his colleagues, you know, Bob Balaban and uh, Charlie Haid, and mm -hmm. you didn't see that in movies much, that sort of philosophical, academic 
and they did it at top speed. I don't know if you recognize it, but they just they spoke so quickly. Mm. I thought that was kind of an interesting take because it meant that these guys were just so familiar with this psychoanthropology and whatever else they dealt with. Mm. For those people that aren't familiar with it, it's about a guy that goes into an isolation tank and is trying to access what we would call the lizard brain, or he's trying to access a primal man inside himself. Mm. And of course he does access that. Mm. That's what I found really original and really interesting. Plus I was, you know, a Patty Chayefsky fan. I, I was aware of how well known he was as a screenwriter and uh, pretty much a legend in the industry. Yeah, it's kind of the third in a trilogy for Patty Chayefsky, isn't it? Because he'd done scathing social commentaries for the hospital and network. So he'd looked at the US healthcare system and predicted almost the problems that would come from yeah. news networks. <laughs> <laughs> and this is him taking a stab at academia and yep. psychoanalysis and so on. And yeah, it's almost like a continuation. But oddly enough, he took his name off of this film. Yeah, I remember there being sort of a... I didn't really go too far into it. I'm just going by what I... My, my initial impressions when I first saw it, mm. because I was not sophisticated enough to know to see it as a critique of academia. Mm. Um, I thought it was like really cool, you know, the <laughs> stuff that when you look at it a second time and you go, oh, he's making fun of that, or he's sort of pointing out the negative aspects of that. When I was that age, of course, when you're in college, when you're 20, you think all that stuff is awesome, you know? Mm. So it was very stimulating for me, and it wasn't until I saw it 30, 40 years later that I realized that it, it maybe was a bit more of a commentary on it than sort of celebrating it. Mm. So it, it did kind of pale a little bit when I saw it the second time, and I was like, oh, I see, that really wasn't... We're not really supposed to be rooting for him as much as I did when I first saw it. Mm. And a lot of it was a little overplayed, the dream sequences and, and, the, and the hallucinations and stuff. And, yeah. But I just thought that the whole basic subject matter was so compelling yes. that we could somehow access our sort of primal selves that may lie dormant in our current bodies. Yes. Yeah, I really was engaged in, in the sort of the premise that you could access that primal self, but then externalized so your body regressed to that primal self as well so the character Eddie Jessup turned into a, a primal man a proto-human yeah uh, a, an ape and started having very <laughs> sort of basic uh, animal instincts and it was r something I'd never really thought about like it, it was such a profound premise with all the green sequences and really abstract imagery it was pretty much the epitome of art house i would say uh, it was an audio visual experience and not necessarily a good one as well a very jarring yes you felt uncomfortable mm. yeah well, I think, you know, Ken Russell was sort of known for being fairly excessive. But as a kind of a young person, I sort of celebrated that and thought, oh, well, you know, he's pushing the edge, you know, he's, I don't care if he's a little outrageous, you know, it's because uh, I liked all the, I liked the devils and I liked uh, mm. some of the other ones that he'd done. But it was excessive. But at a certain time in your life, you tend to be a little bit more appreciative than, say, maybe as you get older. <laughs> I mean, personally, I did watch this for the first time as a young 20 something year old so for me it was amazing i was deeply moved by it and i loved that he does really push boundaries yeah. and this is the only film i've i've seen of ken russell i actually expected more because i've heard of him being very very out there yeah and i thought this movie was a pretty coherent film it wasn't actually that out there in my opinion there were definitely a, a lot of scenes that were what we would describe as completely batshit crazy <laughs> but still concise. Yeah. Well, I think that was probably one of the reasons that the writer took his name off of it, because I think he may have been a more, maybe more disciplined writer than the filmmaker was a disciplined filmmaker. Mm. And so it might have bothered him that he kind of overstated something or put it in a different category of film. Mm. You know, it's just like letting somebody run wild with something. I've done theater pieces where, you know, the director will take what the writer has written and make it 
way outrageous and the writer you know freaks out and says hey 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 hold on (laughs) yeah looking into it i think the key issue for the writer was that ken russell was not necessarily filming the dialogue in its entirety and all the way that he wanted and i think the words were very important to him yeah and the dialogue is very bookish and stagey it's not naturalistic at all and i know they're they're academics I'm surrounded by <laughs> academics every day. Yeah. But even they don't necessarily talk like the characters in this movie. It's kind of amped up a few notches. Yes, I would say definitely. And I think another trick that directors do sometimes is if the director wants to put his visual stuff and he has things he wants to put in, but he knows he has to put in a lot of dialogue in the film and the writer doesn't want to cut any of it, the trick is, and I've had to do this on several occasions, force the actors to speed through the dialogue so wow. that you can keep the dialogue and not cut any of it. But it's jarring that it goes so quickly. Yeah. Huh? That's why some great writers like Mamet and um, Aaron Sorkin, they write quickly and it's to be done quickly mm-hmm. so that you can't speed it up anymore. <laughs> or whatever, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, Shakespeare is also meant to be done fairly quickly too. And it's this American thing of having long pauses and stuff that is fairly new to drama. I mean, historically, I don't mean like in the last 10 years. I mean, like in the last 100. (laughs) Another characteristic of Ken Russell that he brings to this movie is a fascination with religious imagery. Ah, I'm not sure whether that may have been another reason why he clashed with the writer, whether that was too strong an emphasis, because there is a lot of religious imagery in this movie. Yeah. But Bill Hurt's character talks about that, like he had a real religious upbringing and a very religious orientation, you know, for a man at that time. So it seems like it was part of the script. He Mm. talks about having all these religious crises and soul searching and all that stuff. I think he does. I mean, I think he Mm. talks about it. It's not just, you know, the goat's heads and the crosses and the... (laughs) He uses. Mm, I completely agree. But also, I would say more spirituality is a very uh, important theme of the film. Yes. And that ties in with the whole psychedelia yeah. aspect as well, taking psychedelics, hallucinogenics, to kind of be more in touch with your spiritual self. And then that tying into primal self. I thought there were a lot of very well sort of interconnected themes to do with consciousness and reality and also, I guess, evolution of man. Uh, I personally like the contrast between the incredibly intellectual academics at the university and then you would cut to a very carnal, primal sex scene yeah. <laughs> between Eddie Jessup and Emily. And it's just the jarringness of that. It's a great contrast, a great juxtaposition. Yeah. And then Eddie himself actually becomes an ape and loses the ability to talk. He is just yelping and <laughs> screaming, and it's it's a wonderful kind of, uh, yeah, contrast. Well, you get the feeling that because he is such a mental character and because he is such a verbal person that he's kind of a prisoner of his own academic mind. That's why he so hungers to be that non-thinking, just being being. Mm, (laughs) It makes sense character-wise that he would want to escape his own mentality. Yeah, yeah, for sure. The drug aspect of it was uh, also something that sort of resonated personally with me because I was never a drug person. Mm. You know, the people that I grew up with, they would go out and, you know, get stoned or do, you know, mushrooms or whatever and drive ass or something. And I never really understood why they did it. To me, it was just like kicks, like, you know, jumping off the roof or, you know, hey, how high can you jump into the swimming pool? You know, it was (laughs) that rather than some sort of heady spiritual quest that it really was. Mm. And when after seeing that movie, it kind of blew my mind where I, I finally realized that all those people that I thought were doing that stuff for kicks or just to, you know, destroy their brain they really had a reason for it you know at least some of the original people i don't know about my friends but you know the original people that you know ken kesey and all those guys you know the 60s people and all the that did hallucinogenic drugs you know it just made me feel like oh that's what they're doing when in fact a lot of them maybe were just doing it because they were bored or they were you know mm. but there really was a, a kind of spiritual quest or another thing going on a little less self-destructive <laughs> mm. yeah i definitely agree and i actually think this movie represents that sort of psychedelic 
quest for spiritual enlightenment really well. Yeah. Um, visually and, and also audio uh, sonically as well. It's like tripping out watching this film. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it is an experience. It's like a voyage that you go on. Because he's he's often immersed in this isolation tank, so it's this, this metal tank that he's closed into, but he's kind of floating on water, and I guess that catalyzes this hallucinogenic state. But it's interesting because I've seen that exact tank in the TV show, that's um, quite a recent TV show called Fringe, which delves into the fringe science and that sort of thing. And they also do inject LSD into the character, and she goes into this tank and taps into a different state of consciousness. What's interesting as well is Blair Brown, the actress yeah. that's in Altered States, is also in Fringe oh. as a, as another character. So there's that sort of tie-in. So uh, I don't know whether uh, Fringe was uh, influenced by Altered States, but there's a lot of similarities. Oh, wow, uh, yeah. okay. That's a J.J. Abrams series, isn't it? Yes, yeah. yes. So it's interesting with that, that it's sort of exploring parallel universes and perception. I mean, one of the things that's really interesting in Altered States is how much of what Eddie is experiencing is real and how much of it is just an exploration of his own mind. Because, of course, it eventually enters the physical world. So it, within the confines of the story, it's a real experience. Yeah. But one of the criticisms of the movie is that the visions that Ken Russell comes up with were, and I think the critic that I saw, they said it was disappointingly literal. And if you trace the visions through the movie, they do kind of thematically follow what he's talking about in the previous scene. So he talks about his father's death and giving up his faith in God. And then the next vision that he has right. is his father dying and crucifixes and goat's heads and, <laughs> and sacrifices and this kind of thing. And then later on, when he's talking about divorcing Emily because he's sick of this domesticated life and he wants to tap into the primal, the next vision that he has has flashes of him and Emily as these Edwardian gentle people <laughs> eating sorbet, I think, right. <laughs> <laughs> versus a tribal ritual of some kind. So you could see the film as just an exploration of this character's psyche, but then, of course, he actually starts to physically transform. So the movie becomes something else almost at that point. There's no ambiguity there. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, when you when you mention it that, it, it sort of reminds me of the nuts and bolts of dreaming. Mm. You know, you the day before you mention something and then it shows up in your dream when you don't even think about it. Yeah. And that's what that reminds me of. As a young man, when I watched it the first time, I was more interested in the Jekyll and Hyde monster on the loose, yeah. uh, waking up in the zoo, having eaten something <laughs> and waking up naked, that kind of stuff. And then what Watching it again sort of 20 years later, I'm more interested in the metaphysical aspects of it and yeah. find the monster on the loose aspects a little bit less interesting. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think you're right because I've, I already know what happens, you know, in other words, in seeing it the second time, it's like, oh, yeah, well, you know, it becomes real and he goes out and he gets caught. And then I think just by virtue of it being a movie, they had to have something like a chase scene or a, you know, a third act kind of action sequence. And and not so much all this talking and hallucinating. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. Uh, I feel like the first half is very theoretical, and then the second half is physical. You see things happening in front of you. It's not some sort of hallucination. Yeah. And then at the end, with all this kind of cosmic horror happening and Eddie becoming just a blob of flesh and yelling, it's almost like you can't really even describe what's happening. You don't really know whether it's real or not real. Um, there's vortexes and all sorts of imagery. And it's, yeah, it's a great example of, of cosmic horror being unexplainable. You can't really figure out if it's actually there or if it's not there. And I, I think also with the, with the music as well in that scene, it becomes very synth heavy as well. Lots yeah. of weird electronic sounds. And that goes into the fact that, yeah, even music is unexplainable at that point. It's, <laughs> it's coming from instruments that aren't real instruments or acoustic instruments, whereas previously it was all very orchestral and lots mm. of strings and woodwind and brass yep. and percussion and that sort of thing. Well, I think that's similar to like 
time travel is such a popular thing in films and and I think if you put two alternative timelines together it's kind of like splitting an atom or something it's <laughs> that's sort of what it reminds me of it reminds me of some sort of nuclear fusion or collision is really the only thing I can think of mm. hmm. I mean it's it's also that idea of you can't really grasp what you're looking at because you've never seen it before yeah. it's like with with the native americans when they first saw the ships of Christopher Columbus coming in they didn't yeah. they just denied that that was happening because they'd never seen that before right. uh, and I feel like that's that as a viewer I was denying what I was seeing because I'd never seen something like that, <laughs> that before <laughs> that and there's a limit to what you can do on film when you're talking about that you know yeah. that's very true it is fascinating though where they decide to go with this visualization of cosmic horror because the ending struck me so much visually as being an inversion of 2001 it's the same sort of trippy psychedelic visual experience but whereas 2001 is a transition to a next evolutionary step in this movie, he comes to a, a sort of a singular point of existential horror and realizes that there really isn't anything there. <laughs> or, you know, as John Lennon said, all you need is love. You know, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> that's the final thing is, you know, with his wife, you kind of already knew what it was. Mm. You know, like when you say, well, the meaning of life is love, you know, and that's all there is to it, you know, and it's that simple. But with somebody that is so fixated on redefining everything, I, I see. I wouldn't say that there's no answer at the end. I would say that it's kind of was whatever it is right in front of him, you know. Mm. And the last scene, to me at least, says that it's about just love and like the simplest thing you can think of. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree as well. I, I always think it's a little bit of a cop out in movies when the answer to everything is the power of love will will fix all <laughs> all woes. <laughs> but in, in this film, I, I don't think they do it in a cheesy way. Like they really show that. Eddie doesn't even acknowledge love as a quantifiable thing. He's seeking the truth so desperately that when he finds the truth, love is the only thing that brings him back because he tries to save Emily because she's turned into some sort of red love of woman. I'm not entirely sure what happens there. But (laughs) no, it's that that's well, I think that visual effect was more of a function of the limited visual effect capability they had at that time. Yeah they probably could have done something better had the visual effects at the time been more sophisticated. Yes. Yeah. Now it's time for Random Trivia. So Dan, what piece of trivia have you wrestled back from the primordial ooze for us to enjoy today? Speaking of primordial ooze, this was uh, one of the first (laughs) films that used primitive CGI, apparently. But I'm not sure whether this is true now, talking to Lance about The Last Starfighter. (laughs) So in the final transformation scene with Eddie turning into the weird fleshy blob (laughs) with the one arm and he's he's punching the wall also with Emily turning into a a lava lady so all those kind of granularly distorted energy effects were created using rotoscope mats by a computer Ah, that was me just thinking it was a TV tuned to no signal (laughs) You know what the scene reminded me of where he was in the corridor and he was all interference covered and he was ramming himself against the wall in order to reconstitute himself and get back to his girl. It reminded me of the AHA video for Take On Me. Yeah, yeah, right. (laughs) And that's our trivia. (laughs) Yeah. Altered States reminds me a lot of Close Encounters, um, not just in the way that it's shot. There are some images in there, like the guys walking into the cave and they're backlit with light shining. It's very much like the returnees at the end of Close Encounters, but but also how it focuses on a man's single-minded obsession with finding some truth and exploring the boundaries of the universe. Crucially, at the expense of his role as a husband and as a father, yeah. I mean, Eddie Jessup's kids are pretty much an afterthought the whole way throughout this movie. Yeah. And I remember Steven Spielberg saying that Close Encounters was obviously a film made by a man who hadn't been a father at that point in his life. And I was wondering what we thought of the family dynamic that's going on here and whether your perception of the film changes from when you watched it before being a father to now. Well, it felt a little bit like, and of course it was made by people who maybe belonged to an earlier generation where the kids and the domestic stability and all that stuff was the mom's job. 
Mm. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, don't bother me. I'm, I'm being a genius. <laughs> so it felt a little old school. I mean, like you would call it, you know, sexist or chauvinist or whatever, but it felt old, but, it, but it was produced and filmed and by people that were part of that generation. Mm. And I'm not talking about the actors. I'm talking about the, you know, the writers and the, the directors and it's the kids definitely <laughs> were kind of <laughs> like, Oh yeah, my dad's doing this crazy stuff and I'm just sort of uh, following my mom around and uh, you know, we'll, we'll be all right. <laughs> I just basically attributed that to what the old generation did. Yeah. I was really surprised to find out that one of the kids is a young Drew Barrymore. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I know, Drew Barrymore, really, of all people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bless her. She's just completely ignored in this movie. Well, she, that was, I think that was her first movie. So I think it was like, oh, let's get this kid. Oh, yeah, you'll be fine. <laughs> you know, it's not really about you. So <laughs> I don't know that anyone had any uh, obligation to like, oh, yeah, we, get, we need more Drew screen time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a critique. Okay. See, the thing is, I, I'm playing both sides here because I, <laughs> yes. I I can tell you what I really liked about it at first, because even though it was a super intellectual movie, it really hit me on a non-intellectual level, like mm. a real kind of spiritual type level, really abstract level when I first saw the movie. And then when I saw it again, all these things were like, wait, why'd they do that? Uh -huh. You know, mm. for example, like Charlie Haid was directed to just be really pissed off all the time. <laughs> And I really like that actor. I think he's a really good actor. But it's like he was directed to just yell at the guy the whole time and just be pissed off all the time. Did you notice that? Yeah. Because <laughs> I know that's not an actor choice. An actor would realize, oh, yeah, I've done this 95% of the time. Maybe I don't need to do it anymore. And the director's like, oh, no, no, do it some more. So I don't know. I don't know that that actually took place. But I, I felt like the director was not concerned about how one note his criticism was and he you know ended up being a great guy he ended up being this really stand-up guy that sort of saves the day in the end and stuff but oh my god it was like why are they doing that <laughs> i did read somewhere that that's another reason why the writer wanted his name taken off oh. because all of his dialogue was being yelled and yeah. it's like what what why is <laughs> why is this character yelling all the time yeah. yeah. I mean, I remember watching a really fascinating behind the scenes with Michael Douglas, where he was talking about how vulnerable you are as an actor, because his approach would be that he would give various different modes of performance for any given moment in the film. And then he would trust the director and the editor to sort of craft his performance over the course of the story so that it would make sense. It would make emotional sense. Mm. Yeah. I just imagine that maybe this guy just delivered a kind Calm version and then a shouty version and they just used all the shouting takes. <laughs> yeah, could be. That's just, I, I can't stand that. You know, I never do that. When directors are always saying that to me and I'm always like, no, if I can't really feel it, if I can't really understand what you're saying, I'm just going to do it the way I want to <laughs> <I'm gonna> do it. <laughs> they don't trust them, you know. <laughs> like, sometimes there's all kinds of other reasons. Oh, the, you know, there was a plane, there was a shadow, there was a... You know, there was something wrong with there was a line, there was a break, they didn't film it. Something happens and they have to use that wacko thing that you just did because the director said, Hey, just do something crazy and then they <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Lance, you mentioned before that you're very, you're quite a big Bill Hurt fan. Um, can you give us some sort of insight in the acting? Because I, I, I thought the acting in this movie was really phenomenal. Because considering the material they had to deal with, yes, you can overact in something that's so strange and weird. Yes, and I think compared to a lot of other things that he's done, he was a little bit overacting, but I think, how can you avoid it? You know, there's, you have to be in such a state. <laughs> I, I get the feeling they only had a couple of stabs at it when they were shooting it because, you, you know, you just can't hold that, you just can't maintain that amount of intensity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Bill Hurt's a pretty intense guy already. It just seemed like... He was working pretty hard. <laughs> yeah, and often quite naked as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Which can't be fun. No. <laughs> I mean, usually he's intense, but it's underneath a thin veneer of stoicism. It, yeah. It's usually boiling under the surface with him, yeah. I find. Although it's hard to say. He's had so many different phases of his career, you know. The first movies were, mm. I mean, this was a, one of his first movies, first one I ever saw him in, and then Body Heat, and then... Big Chill, I think it was, and oh, yeah. Children of a Lesser God, which I thought was really great. Mm. I was doing this play once in upstate New York, you know, goofy comedy play about bicycle riders in Manhattan. And we were doing a run-through for the stage manager, and the director wasn't there. 
and I had a line that if you looked at the page and the script, it was a monologue, but it was only two lines. So there was a run on sentence that went for like a half a page and then another run on sentence that went for another half a page. So oh, wow. I kind of like took a deep breath and like had to spit out this monologue. And I turned to stage left and I kept talking, kept talking. And then I turned to stage right. And as I'm approaching the other actor sitting in the front row is this big guy with blonde hair and a corduroy jacket and these round spectacles. And I was like, <laughs> holy shit, that's Bill Hurt. <laughs> and he's the only person in the audience. And he was friends with the director and he sort of snuck in. And then the director said, why don't you watch a, you know, a, a rehearsal of this play? So, so I just, I kept going and I kept talking, talking, talking and saying my lines. And I was just like totally astral plane detached. You know, I was... <laughs> I was like in another world and I was like, you know, he's a weird thing. You know, I was like 26 years old and stuff, even though I'd made movies and stuff. It's not like I, I didn't get starstruck. So I was totally starstruck by Bill Hurt. Oh, yeah. And then at the end of the rehearsal, he <laughs> came and, and I think our director said, yeah, yeah, tell him what you think, you know, give him some notes or whatever. So, and we're just like, oh, holy shit, it's Bill Hurt, you know. And we sat and started listening to him. And that guy, he is so smart that you can barely understand it. And I'm a pretty smart guy. I, I can absorb, I don't know, I would say a good deal of abstract thought, but it just, I had no idea what he was saying. <laughs> and a couple of things he directed right at me, and it, they made sense, you know? But everything else was like, wow. <laughs> That guy's in the ozone. And it's not like I thought he was crazy or anything. I just, it was way, way more complex than I was at all used to. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't wow. know if it was impressive or just bewildering, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, I was definitely starstruck because I just, you know, I thought he was the greatest thing in the world. Wow. Great story. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm amazed you could keep going, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, you just kind of want to, you know, when you, you just go on automatic pilot, you know, you just kind of, luckily it was late enough in the process where I didn't have to go, line, <laughs> just <laughs> blank. I just left my body, you know. Coming to you live from the Movie Oubliette Theatre, it's the prestigious Movie Awards. All right, people, I'm sure you've all taken the Mexican psychedelic drug and awaiting the mind-expanding Moobly <laughs> Awards to begin. This is where we nominate a bunch of our favorite things in the number of completely useless categories. Best quote. So mine was, uh, so I think Emily is trying to convince Eddie to marry her. Mm. This is after they've been going out for a while. They've copulated their love a number of times. <laughs> so Emily says to him, <laughs> even sex is a mystical experience for you. You carry on like a flagellant, which can be very nice. But sometimes I wonder if it's me being made love to. I feel like I'm being harpooned by some raging monk in the act of receiving God. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, which is exactly the same quote that I wrote down as well. Wow! <laughs> word for word. I love that. Yeah, their sexual relationship is quite odd, mm. isn't it? Because I remember the, their first intimate scene together is shot and scored like one of Eddie's visions. Yeah. It's got John Carigliano's clusters of uneasy strings and it's all lit with this hot, steamy, uncomfortable mm. orange lighting. And he sort of stops mid-stroke to talk to her about Christ, crucifixion and his father's painful death from cancer. Ah. Very romantic. <laughs> yeah, as first dates go, this is not great. No. <laughs> <laughs> Most 80s moment. I thought the film was quite 70s, actually. But if I had to pick something, it would be technological, obviously. So it would be the encephalographs spilling out reams of paper with squiggly mm. brainwave lines yes. on them. Like lie detector tests, you'd always get those in thriller movies like Basic Instinct where somebody's being tested and they'd sort of scribble notes on the paper as it flies mm, out. Yeah. So, yeah. You don't get that kind of stuff anymore. No, no. Back in the analog age, it was all about that squiggly line. It was, yeah. <laughs> Lots of paper. Cut down those forests. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with you. I, I did think this movie was very 70s. I think it actually is set in the 70s, though, because... Uh, that's true. Eddie 
wears some definitely very 70s clothing. Uh, my most 80s moment is just the use of bladder effects. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so when Eddie is, is regressing to this kind of simian creature, um, he's, his arm is just pulsating like it's, <laughs> it's, I don't know, it's really hard to describe. Even his stomach is almost like undulating, it's like a wave of, of fleshy... <laughs> pulsating <laughs> but yeah the use of bl- bladder effects which uh those of you that that don't know it's it's just like a i guess like a some sort of bag mm. thing that inflates and deflates is, is it air or is it is it liquid I've, I've never really known i think it's air yes and it's very thin sometimes they would use condoms i think Ew. actually and just put it up underneath the latex skin as a special effect so that the body would appear to bubble and Ew. convulse Love those 80s bladders. <laughs> <laughs> Best hair or costume? Yeah, I think I mentioned it already when we were talking about it being 70s. Mm. So there is one scene where Eddie is wearing what looks like to be straight from Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> he just returned from the disco the night before. He's, he's wearing this baby blue large collared 70s disco shirt under a black sports jacket. Mm. If, he, if he just replaced his face with John Travolta's, uh, you would think you were watching Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> yeah, there are some great fashions in here. My favourite, actually, is that whenever the two academics, Emily and Eddie, whenever they go south of the border on one of their research trips, they always wear the most stereotyped archaeological explorer outfits you can imagine, uh, with yes. their matching khaki <laughs> shirt and shorts, and these really fetching knee socks pulled all the way up. Oh, yes. <laughs> I don't know if they have the same outfit and just sort of swap as to whoever's going on a research trip. You know, you get the knee socks. I don't know, <laughs> but they both wear exactly the same outfit. It's really funny. <laughs> They're just missing a pith helmet. It's really mm. stereotypical. Mm, mm, mm. Favourite scene. My favourite scene is the last time Eddie goes into the isolation tank and all hell breaks loose, a vortex opens up, Mm. there's these glowing line drawings of the isolation tank that are expanding and the room's destroyed and everyone's screaming and Emily has to be dragged out of the room Mm. and left in the corridor. It's so exciting, it's sort of what you imagine groundbreaking research in universities must be like. Um, Having worked at a university for quite some time, I can tell you it's not quite that melodramatic <laughs> but <laughs> I do think it's a really exciting scene mm, that that scene is is an assault to the eyes and ears really it goes full throttle uh, it's not the sort of thing you can look away no it wakes you up that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> sure does uh, my favourite scene was uh, the big hallucination scene, actually. So mm. Eddie is just drunk in this Mexican concoction mm. and uh, he starts to trip out. There's fireworks, there's a Native American tribal dance number, there's <laughs> lizards, there's snakes. But I really loved the end of the scene because uh, so the vision of Emily appears and she's just stark naked, just uh, in the kind of a sphinx pose on, on the ground, mm. on the sand, and Eddie just kind of, just casually reclines on the side. And then the wind is just <laughs> blowing around them and there's all this dust and sand and they slowly get covered by all the this debris. And then uh, they become made of sand, mm. kind of the image of, of just being made of dust and ash, I guess, and, and then they just slowly blow away. Yes. It's a really, really well done little scene and it goes for a lot longer than you expect as well. Mm. Just a great end to this otherwise kind of expected psychedelic trip out. Like I, I didn't expect mm. that. No, it's quite thought-provoking, isn't it? It gives you a real moment of pause as they're slowly being eroded by time. Yes. It's fantastic yes. stuff. Most cliched sci-fi moment. So mine's not exactly sci-fi in its cliché, but just a uh, sort of bad hallucination cliché. Uh-huh. So for some reason, in bad hallucinations, you either see bugs or you see snakes. <laughs> And he sees a snake. <laughs> and, and granted, there is a lot of religious imagery and snakes have always been an omen of Satan or sin. Um, <laughs> so there's that. 
but every time you always see snakes. And for you, Conrad, what was your cliche? My cliche is just the mad scientist cliche. I oh. think <laughs> there wasn't any specific scene, but I think having a scientist who is so focused on the truth and the discovery and breaking new ground mm. that they experiment on themselves to disastrous effect mm. I think is very familiar from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and, and certainly the mad scientist who has a spat with his girlfriend and then does an experiment while nobody's there yeah. became very familiar from <laughs> uh, Jeff Goldblum's turn as the fly in 1986 ah, so it's continued ever since then. Mm, and a lot of similarities to the fly as well. Yeah, there are definitely. <laughs> Although <laughs> Emily doesn't blow William Hurt's brains out <laughs> at the end of this movie <laughs> Spoiler alert. Not quite. <laughs> favorite <laughs> special effect. So oddly enough, my favorite special effect is a special effect and not a visual effect. So it's something that was achieved practically on set. And it's during that favorite scene of mine, the last experiment with the isolation tank. It's when all of the overhead pipes in the room, and there are loads of them, and they're all made out of metal and they're huge, they all convulse and get crushed by the force of the expanding power from the vortex inside the isolation tank. Mm. And because it's full scale and live and practical and happening right in front of Emily's eyes, it's quite shocking, I thought. Yeah, I would have been terrified for sure. Mm. My favourite special effect, so you've mentioned it already, it's the vortex. So mm. it's just really, it looked really cool. Yeah. I don't exactly know how they did it, but it looked like a combination of water and, and fog mm. and uh, lighting coming from the floor. So it was just this yeah. big glowing, swirling vortex of steaminess. Yes. That just <laughs> It looked really, really cool. And having Emily walking in it as well, just yeah. made it even cooler. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing. If it had been a visual effect that she was matted into, it wouldn't have been the same no, at all. it would have looked terrible. <laughs> Best sound effect! I found it hard finding uh, a sound effect that I really liked in this film, but there was one that was kind of a little bit quirky, I guess. So it's in the big hallucination scene and Eddie sees a giant monitor lizard and it's it's flicking its tongue in and out, but it doesn't sound like how you would expect a, a tongue to sound. It sounds like... <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's some sort of synth sound, I think, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's definitely very trippy. <laughs> It is, yeah. I mean, I didn't have a favourite sound effect, but I did find some of the sound effects during those trippy sequences, the synthesised noises, mm. were a little bit like early Doctor Who. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Most funniest scene. I didn't have a funniest scene specifically, but I just found that every scene that Mason Parrish was in, ah. um, played by Charles Hayde, He's this irritating, brusque, abrasive cynic who just seems to criticise them and shout at them throughout the whole movie. But he's with them along for the ride, really dedicated all the way through it, all the way to the end. But I just found him hysterical because his energy was just, it just filled the room whenever he walked in and I found him hilarious. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely agree. I think Lance touched on it as well, just the fact that he, mm. he's just shouting his dialogue every every <laughs> moment. I actually, for my funniest scene, I had him as well and there's one line Eddie's trying to convince him that he actually did regress externally into a proto-human as he described and Mason has just listed off a whole bunch of his credentials saying like I don't believe you I'm, I'm this I'm this I'm this and then he says <laughs> and I'm not going to listen to any more of your capitalistic quantum friggin dumb limbo mumbo jumbo and he just walks off into the stairwell <laughs> shouting this and it's just unintentionally <laughs> hilarious to me <laughs> Yeah, he's got an amazing energy in this movie and it's like a shot in the arm because William Hurt is so... He's passionate, but he's so serious and mm. considered. And his friend, played by Bob Balaban, who ever since Close Encounters has always played this sort of bearded, quiet, intelligent guy mm -hmm. that you you just can't help but love. He's got a different energy. And then in comes Mason, swearing and shouting. <laughs> what the... 
fuck are you doing? I don't believe it. Yeah, it's it's great. It really gives the movie a shot in the arm every mm. time he turns up. Yes, yes, agreed. <laughs> and that's our movies. Can I chip in? Gary, are you still here? Uh, I guess, what did you think about the movie? I really loved the song Cool Rider. I thought Michelle Pfeiffer did a great job of it. Are you talking about Grease 2? Yeah. <sighs> right. Wonderful. Okay, welcome back. It's final verdict time. Should Altered States be released from the isolation tank to romp through the city zoo? Or should it be thrown back into the existential void to be lost forever? Lance, you chose this film for us and you're the guest, so I believe you should go first. What would be your your final argument? It's very difficult because Mm. I see it as ambitious and abstract and kind of profound and original and daring, but I also see it as flawed and self-indulgent and unnatural. Mm -hmm. So I would say I'm going to grade it on its initial objective. I will say it deserves to be seen and not to be lost because of the subject matter and because of the intention, the original idea. Mm. And I thought the actors were all good and sincere. Yes, it's very true. I was also ambivalent about it. On the one hand, it kind of feels like two different movies. And maybe that's just my experience of watching it at two different times in my life, that it sort of feels like this very intelligent movie and American Werewolf in London jammed together. Do you think as an experience... It is cohesive and it is worth experiencing. It's a fascinating concept. It's never dull and it's always convincingly portrayed, even with the limitations of the technology of the time. I think you've convinced me. I think it does deserve to be seen. I think it does. How about you, Dan? Well, I would agree with both of you. And uh, Lance, you use the word ambitious. And to a T, this movie is very ambitious. It really does push boundaries. And I love movies that make you think and make you really engage. I was really trying to keep up with the dialogue and really understand what was going on. <laughs> and Conrad, you used another word, cohesive. It was a very cohesive film. I, Before watching it, I expected it to be just crazy and surreal and it is crazy and surreal but at the same time there is a storyline there is a character development there's an arc there's a conclusion it's not open-ended and all you need is love uh, so i i really enjoyed this film it's not the sort of film that you would take your girlfriend or your mum to for a a Saturday night uh, (laughs) cinema experience. Uh, It's a lot more profound, as Lance, you described it, and uh, I think profound is good. I do think some of the the effects are a bit dated. Uh, Some of the green screen effects are a little bit okay. We get it. We get it. Trippy visuals. (laughs) But yes, I I love this film. I think it should be seen by not everyone, but uh, those that like to expand their mind and their their threshold for dialogue. Uh, Yes, this film is the one for you. (laughs) Well, thank you. I'm glad that you saw what I was saying because I am aware of the shortcomings. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. That's okay. I shall throw open that isolated chamber. There it goes. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so good to see another movie set free. Mm. But will we set free a movie next episode, Conrad? Well, who knows? We've been stuck in the 80s and in science fiction and fantasy for a while, so I thought it was time for us to emerge into the bright lights of the 2000s Ooh. and do a horror movie. In fact, a psychological thriller and, in keeping with the theme of our own podcast, a British-Australian co-production going by the title of... Triangle. Oh, a geometric shape. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it's a 2009 psychological horror thriller directed by Christopher Smith, starring Melissa George, Michael Dorman... Henry Nixon, and a young Liam Hemsworth. 
Oh, so that's what we're doing next. How about you, Lance? What are you working on at the moment, and what can we look forward to seeing you in next? Well, let's see.、Um, I did a theater project last winter that we might revisit.、Mm. That was pretty funny, pretty good original idea, and I thought pretty well executed. We did it in this really small theater here in, in, in L.A. It was a、um, a six character sketch comedy style. Play about the making of the Star Wars Holiday Special. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you guys familiar with that? Oh wow! Yes. <laughs> yeah, it was really, really funny, and it's a great script. And we didn't have that much rehearsal because a lot of times the actors, you know, you couldn't get everybody together at the same time, and it was really rough, and everybody had jobs and stuff. We did it in this little theater in Hollywood, and it's this kind of disaster artist version of. Of the making of the Hollywood 1978 Star Wars Holiday Special, it's really, really funny, and it's you know we everybody plays a ton of characters, and、uh, it basically chronicles like how it got started and what was the idea, and then who told who at the network, and then this guy got brought on to the thing, and it just it just gets more and more absurd. I mean, just it's so absurd, and then you see the progression of how. Oh yeah, well let's bring on the you know writers from Carol Burnett. You know, sure that'll be good, just like Star Wars. You know, and I was just very proud of it because it was really successful. And actually, some of the people who actually were involved, some of the writers, you know, they're old guys now. They showed up and they thought it was hilarious, and they were like, "That's exactly what it was. It actually was better than that." Oh, you know, and it was really really funny. And I had a great time. I got to play. Play、uh, Harrison Ford, and I got to play、uh, one of the comedy writers, Pat Proft, and I got to play the guy whose idea it was,、uh, Charles Lippincott, and a friend of mine played George. And <laughs> the whole gang was there, and, and it's who would have thought that you know Star Wars would have been a religion, basically, and. and, and So it was celebrating the 40th anniversary of the、uh, November 17th broadcast of the Star Wars Holiday Special.、Ah. <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> Sounds great. For, certainly for the genre fan base, it's it was a lot of fun. And we were like switching hats and you know putting on shirts and changing characters in the middle of scenes and you know it was a very kind of bull, bullshit common kind of you know thing. So I just literally found out about us revisiting that because we you know we did it about six months ago. What, what was the title? Again, special. I think <laughs>、okay. it might even be special exclamation point. I'm not sure, but、uh, it's just special by、uh, Andrew Osborne, and、uh, it was a lot of fun. So wow, wow, that sounds incredible. It sounds great. I bet you do an amazing Harrison Ford, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was very fun. It was very fun because my years as Johnny Cash, you know. You got that really low kind of voice, and you can. You, know, you have to really go down there. And, and Harrison Ford is such a he's such a fun person to to、uh, to do because he's so comically serious. You know, <laughs> that's great. Well, I hope that goes on tour. That sounds amazing. I think it should, but who knows? You know, it's something you know, we we have to build it. It's been great, lads, having you on the show. And if you want to follow Movie Oubliette, we are on all social media platforms. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as Movie Oubliette. And if you'd like to email us, we are movie dot oubliette at gmail dot com. And if you enjoyed this episode, please do us the great favor of mashing that subscribe button on your iTunes podcasts or Spotify, wherever you're listening to us. And don't forget to rate and review us as well. Yes, and now we have. Patreon, so become a patron. Yes, enjoy all those goodies.、Mm, lots of Lance goodies too. Well, thanks for being with us, Lance. It's been great. All righty. Good <laughs> luck to you. Get some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Bye for now. Bye bye. Goodbye. <laughs> I feel like I'm being harpooned by some raging monk in the act of receiving God.